today we are going to talk a little bit about, a little more about multiple regression correlation. Today will be much less computationally intensive. So if uh, you are worried about all the, the things that you have to compute and you're worrying like, oh, we're going to compute a whole lot of more things, today that's not going to be the case. So we're going to talk about uh, interpreting multiple regression correlation and correlations in general. So we're going to talk about two ideas. One is restriction of range, and the other has to do with regression towards the mean. So let's start with some population. Imagine that we have some population, and that this sample of the population pretty accurately represents that population. Okay. So with this sample, we had a correlation of 0.83, which is what? It's a strong positive correlation, and it's highly significant. Now, the independent variable ranges from about 13, so that's about 13 there, to about 80, okay? So if we were to look at the entire range of the population, you'd say, okay, the, the whole population is basically within this range. Now, when we sample within that range, and adequately represented the population, we found this sample correlation. Now the question with, yes? This is 98. 98, what is 98? It's degrees of freedom, that's exactly right. So in the APA style of presenting the results for a correlation, you say R, 98 degrees of freedom, the value of the correlation, uh, and then the, the probability. You could also think of this a little bit differently. So R is 0.83 and we have some T with 98 degrees of freedom with some value. I forget what it was. I think it was like 17 or 14 or something like that. And then the, the P value. But since it's often, I mean, typically when you're doing this type of thing, you're using the t-test. So to condense the notation, you just see often things like that. All right. So, uh, what if we sample from part of the range? Like, what if we only looked at a part of this? What would happen with the correlation? Does anyone have any predictions? If we sample the part of the correlation go up, would it go down? Would it be the same? Be the same? It depends. Depends on what? Depends on which part did you take. It does depend on which part that we take, somewhat. Uh, but generally speaking, it really doesn't depend very much. So if it doesn't really depend very much, if we take a large enough range, what would we expect to happen? Would we expect no change in the correlation? Would we expect an increase in the correlation or a decrease in the correlation? An increase in the correlation? Maybe. But so, I mean, if you think just about this really tiny restricted thing like he was talking about, if we just took those three, there might be a strong correlation for those three. But if we took a, a bigger chunk, what typically would happen? Let's imagine that we are going to restrict the range. We're only going to look at everything beneath 50. All right? We have some independent variable, some dependent variable. It doesn't matter really what they are. So let's only look at this range right here. Ha ha ha, I'm sorry. Greater than 50. So let's only look at this part of the range up here. We'll look at this part in just a minute. So if you look at that, just eyeballing it, does it look like there's a correlation? It looks like there's a positive correlation, right? It looks like we could draw a line. Maybe throw it like that? No? Yes. If that's not a good line, what, what line would be better? Would this line be better? No, that wouldn't be better. Would this line be better? No. I mean, we, we can figure out, we can do the regression for that part and figure out what the best line would be. But to me, it looks like Still within this range, within this restricted range, it looks like there's still a correlation. Now the question is, 
how big is this correlation compared to what it was previously? So previously, we saw that the correlation was 0.83. So 0.83 and highly significant. When we restrict the range, what happens? Do this one more time. Raise your hand if you think it doesn't change. Raise your hand if you think it increases. About four, five, six, seven, eight of you guys. Raise your hand if you think it decreases. Nobody. <laughs> it decreased. It decreased. Now this is potentially a fluke, right? So earlier he said it depends on which part that you're looking at. So let's look at some other ways that we could potentially divide this up. For this situation, we have a weaker correlation, and it is less significant. I don't have the p-value, like r gave me something, you know, something to the negative, like 6, e to the negative 6, whereas before it's like e to the negative 14. So it was less significant. Okay. Now let's uh, take a look at a different part. So since the correlation for the upper part was weaker, maybe the correlation for the bottom part would be stronger. Right? So maybe if you average out the correlation for the top part and the correlation for the bottom part, you'll get the correlation for the whole thing. Right? Maybe? No? What do you think? You think it will be weaker? Okay, because the covariance, what about the covariance? There's less variance for both. There is less variance for both, he said. So previously we had this, right? And this varies from here to here. But when we looked at this top 50, it only varied from about here to here. And this only varied from about here to here, right? So there's less variance for both. So there's potentially less that they can co-vary? Maybe, let's find out. So let's restrict the range. There is our correlation for the original data set, again. Now we're just going to look at that bottom part, and we're going to see what happens. So predictions. Who thinks it will be bigger? Who thinks there will be no change? Who thinks it will be smaller? OK, almost everyone except you, you're off the hook. You guys, what do you guys think it will be? None of the rest of you indicated. Bigger? No change? Smaller? <laughs> That's sad. OK, thank the four of you guys who indicated. The four of them that made predictions made predictions that it would be smaller. It is smaller, it's 0.65. So before it was 0.83, now it's 0.65. So it's not that we had a stronger correlation up here, and, or I'm sorry, a weaker correlation up here, and a stronger one down here that balanced out. We have a fairly strong correlation for the whole thing, and a weaker correlation here, and a weaker correlation also here. Huh, that's interesting. So we have a weaker correlation that's less significant. Maybe the correlation in the middle part is really strong. So I looked at this like top part, and we looked at the bottom part, and both of those were weaker than overall. Maybe it's the correlation in here, the middle part, that's really strong. It could be balanced out with the other two weaker ones. Does that make sense? Maybe you're saying no. You're saying no, that, that that reasoning doesn't make sense, or no, that won't happen? Uh, I think it will be smaller. You think that the correlation in the middle part will be smaller? Yeah. Yes, yes. Because there's less variance in both of those, so they could potentially co-vary less. Actually, they could still co-vary together a lot. You can imagine if the middle section if all of the data fell like that and then around the middle section. So here, even though the variance might be small, the covariance is really high. So it's not just that the, the variance is smaller, so necessarily, but it's the relationship of the covariances with the variances, right? OK, so we have two people predicting weaker correlations for the middle part. 
How about the rest of you? Who thinks it will be no different? Raise your hand. Who thinks it will be higher? Raise their hand. You said you have to see the, the middle part? So I'm gonna look for this. Higher, lower, what? Higher? How many people think it's gonna be lower? Okay, a fair number of you think that it will be lower. Let's find out. What? Higher. And it's lower. It's lower. So just looking at this part, it's lower. Just looking at this part, it's lower. Just looking at this part, it's lower. So when we have restricted our range, we're not coming up with the right answer, at least in three instances. Maybe I just can pick these. I didn't try to hand pick these. I tried to pick them. I just pick 50 and then uh, whatever. Anyway, let's do one more. Let's look at between 40 and 50. So that's in here. Any predictions? Less. Less, less, less. Don't know? Higher? Higher. Less. 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 Now, do you guys remember the Ash study where he had people indicate the higher lines? <laughs> now, almost everyone has said less. So this increases the likelihood that you also will say less. <laughs> we have a minority influence over here. You say higher. Just to kick the trend. Let's find out. So let's get rid of that. If we just look at this portion here, does it look like we can fit a, a straight line to that? That, that? that fits it well. Let's go like this. Maybe it sort of goes like that. Huh. It is much weaker. Much, much weaker. Very much less. It is no longer significant. The probability of observing a correlation that strong, or that strong or stronger, when there is no correlation in the population is 0.79. So about 80% of the time, if there's no correlation, you would see something that that's, that's that strong, right? Wow, that's interesting. So we have, in all of these situations, we have weaker correlations. Now, I didn't actually find the correlation for those three. We could go and do that, but let's skip that for right now because I don't have the, the data loaded up. But most of the time, you guys see a trend? What is it? So typically when you restrict the range, you end up seeing a decrease in the size of the, the correlation. So in general, if we're talking about restriction of range, we can say that when there's a linear relationship between the two variables, right? In that whole big population, there was definitely a linear relationship. The correlation was very strong, it was very significant. So there was a linear relationship between the two variables, and when we restricted the range, when we only looked at a fraction of the potential values that the independent variable could take, we saw that the correlations massively decreased. So we saw a decrease in the strength of the correlation, we saw decreases in the significance of the correlation. What can this allow you to conclude? Imagine that you had some data set and you didn't know that there was a restriction of range there, what might you conclude faultily? Um, I wouldn't say the conclusion would be about sample size. Make a conclusion about the effects of the, the variables. Is there a relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable? How strong is that relationship? How big are we going to do? Okay. So when you have less sample size, you have less variation 
you want to divide that by seven the deviation of both of them is going generally to lower the correlation. So again, with the, the covariance, like it, it depends on how the things covary. And the correlation gives us you know, an index sort of of the covariance that's been appropriately weighted, right? But what would you conclude about the correlation between two variables if you were looking at a set of data that came from a restricted range and you didn't know that the range had been restricted? So what might you conclude? I mean, imagine that you had this data set, right? Just this little piece in the middle. This was all that you saw. What would you conclude about the relationship between those variables? You would conclude that there is none. Is there a relationship between the variables? There is a relationship between the variables, and it's a very strong relationship, right? But you didn't know. You didn't know, right? So you concluded that there was no relationship when, if you had all of the data available, you would have been able to see that there was a relationship. So by restricting the range, you could potentially conclude that there is no correlation when in fact there is one. What type of an error would that be? A beta error, right? So beta error is when you fail to reject the null when you should have. So you should have failed to reject the null because there is a real relationship in the population as a whole. But by looking only at that little part, you weren't able to see the variations in the population as a whole and account for those and their covariance and come to the right conclusion. You can also conclude that the correlation is weaker than it was, right? So even in the previous examples where we found significant relationships, so this was a significant relationship, the correlation was weaker than it was in the population, right? So this could be a problem. What about curve linear relationships? So those were for just strictly linear relationships, right? What about curve linear relationships? It's going to be worse? What do you mean worse? Can you like quantify worse? You're just looking at the part of a curve linear which is going to make it increasing, increasing like no, it doesn't have to be increasing. It's going to be weaker in general. It's going to be weaker in general? So in general, if we do this with the curve linear relationship, it will be weaker in general. Does everyone agree with that? No. We have one person that disagrees. For a curve linear relationship, imagine we have some curve linear relationship, and we restrict the range. Are we going to find a stronger, a weaker, or no difference in the correlations? He's changing his opinion. He says stronger. Stronger. It will be weaker. Were you also saying weaker? We have two people saying stronger, two people saying weaker. How about you guys? Weaker, stronger. Stronger. She doesn't know. What information do you need to know? Because I like her answer so far. I think she's given me the best answer yet. Yes. Uh, if you take like for linear coordination for the first part, we should like we should see the increasing, but when we take the middle, we should we see like again coordinate, but uh, we will see like no relationship maybe again. Huh. But at the end we will see decrease. So if if we have some function like this, and let's say that the correlation was zero, right? If if we were to just look at this part. We might say, oh, oh, there's a strong positive correlation. And if we were to look at this part, we would say, oh, oh there's a strong negative correlation. And if we looked in the middle part, maybe we would say, there's no correlation. So it, it depends. Maybe. Maybe. Let's find out. So imagine we have some population that is well represented by the following. In this population, what do we have? Well, we have a negative correlation, 0.14, but it is 
Not it is her. Not strong. It is not strong. That's true. It is not significant. So what does that mean? Basically, it means that the correlation is zero. You can't distinguish this from a correlation of zero, right? All right. Again, we have the, the, about the same range of the independent variable. The range of the dependent variables has changed a bit. But let's see what happens if we only sample from part of that range. OK, so let's do it. Restricting the range to above 50. Uh, I'm going to try to do it right this time. So this should be all of this, right? Ooh, it's a very strong correlation. What type of correlation? Why is it negative? Because it goes down. If we were to draw a line through this, right? The line would look something like that, just through this portion. An increase in the IV is associated with a decrease in the dependent variable. When we go up here, we go down there. Negative correlation. And it's a strong negative correlation, 0.85. And it is statistically significant. So we have a stronger correlation that is more significant. What if we looked at the part beneath 50? So this part over here, a strong positive correlation. Let's see. Oh, yes. So 0.82, if you're to draw a line through this, Maybe it looks something like that. Again, this is statistically significant. So when we were looking at the whole range of the data, we said that there's basically no correlation. But when we looked at only a part of the correlation, in one situation, we came up with the answer that said that there is a very strong negative correlation. And we looked at the other part of the data, and we said that there's a very strong positive correlation. What if we look in the middle? No correlation in the middle. Almost. Almost correlation in the middle. So let's find out. We're going to look in between <coughs> about there. We're going to be looking in there. Is there a correlation in there? No. No? It's curvilinear. It's curvilinear? Well, we actually have a significant correlation there. A significant positive correlation. Now, this is not a strong correlation. It's a, a weaker correlation. But it's positive. So maybe we should make a line like that. Well, maybe like that. We could do the regression on that part to find out the line that best fits that. But when we look just at that part, we again found a significant correlation. It was positive. The correlation was stronger and more significant than it was originally. How about if we further restrict the range? So only look in between 40 and 50. So that's approximately in there. No correlation. No correlation? No correlation? No correlation. No correlation. The correlation is weaker. So the, the original one is like 0 0.14, 0 .0, negative 0 0.09 is, is weaker than 0.14. It's also much less significant than we had originally. Right? So when we had a curve linear relationship, the answer really sort of depended on what part of the range that we were restricting ourselves to. Right? Whereas that wasn't really the case when we had a strictly linear relationship. When we had a strictly linear, linear, linear relationship, almost all of the time we saw decreases in the correlation. With the curve linear relationship, sometimes we saw increases, sometimes we saw decreases. It depended. So if we want to talk about restriction of range more generally, that could account for linear or curve linear relationships, what could we say? It's changing. What's changing? Correlation. The correlation. 
of what? Correlation of the population or the correlation of the sample? The correlations of the samples are depending on the range, right? So when there is a relationship, notice earlier I said when there's a linear relationship. Here I just said when there's a relationship between two variables, linear or curve linear, restricting the range usually misrepresents the true relationship in the population. Right? We found something very different in all of the situations. For the linear relationship, we found much weaker relationships or no relationship at all. For the curve linear relationship, we found stronger and weaker relationships depending. So usually you see weaker for linear relationships, and it depends on what part of the population is being represented in the sample for the curve linear relationships. So what are some implications of this? Can you guys think of it? This could drastically affect your alpha and beta error. But I'm sorry. It, it, it. <laughs> that was wrong. What was wrong? It should affect one of those, but not the other. It should affect our beta errors, right? But not our alpha errors. But uh, we rejected the law while we should have rejected it for the third time. We was strongly significant in relation just to the third time. Uh, 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 uh. So, I guess it depends on what you think of how you re think about the alpha error. So, earlier when we were talking about the whole population, when we restricted the range to a particular sample, and we were treating that sample as if it's representative of the population. So, the alpha error should be contained for that range that's contained. But when you exclude, yeah, okay. All right, so. Uh, you should limit the conclusions to populations from which you actually sample. So imagine that you were doing some study on response times in high school and college students. They're in some driving simulator, right? So they're driving, and then all of a sudden you have some simulated cat run out in front of the car. And you want to see how long it takes them to hit the brake, okay? That's a response time. How long it takes to hit the brake once the cat has appeared. Do you have any predictions about what should happen? Do you think there will be a relationship between their response times and, and their ages, perhaps? No? Maybe experience? I would guess that response times would decrease with increasing age in high school and college students. The brain is still maturing, you're getting more myelination, if you guys have taken biopsychology, the myelination is the fat that goes over the axons and helps messages travel more rapidly. Yeah. Right? So as long as the brain is maturing, getting more myelinated, your response times should decrease. You should be able to react faster to things than you should otherwise. Now, if you made some good conclusion like this, response times decrease with increasing age in high school and college students, and you looked at high school and college students, is that a reasonable conclusion? No? What would be a better conclusion? Because, I mean, if you have range from high school to 60 years old drivers, okay. then it would be important. So if we Today. included high school to 60 year olds, we would better be able to say something like this? Uh -huh. The range here is limited, right? So you can imagine ages. Like we could go from 0 to like 90, 100, right? What should happen to response times? A perfect linear relationship? So like... Babies are really, really fast. Babies get like, whoa, hit the brakes. Be curve linear, like what? Until like 25, then start to be Yeah, so curve linear, so it would actually, it would decrease. 
response times would decrease, they would be faster. So this is slower and this is faster. Right? So you'd expect something like this. They're about uh, I said 25, so like that. The shape may differ a little bit, but some type of per linear relationship, right? Now think, we looked at high school and college students. So we're looking at students, let's say, that are in this range, right? Can we conclude this based on the sample? Yes. We have one yes. Thank you. I agree that that's a very reasonable thing to conclude. Why? Because you have actually sampled from the population that you're talking about. The sample is high school and college students, right? And you are making a conclusion about what? High school and college students. Yeah. Does that make sense? Now, this, I think, is not the appropriate conclusion to make, right? Response times decrease with increasing age, regardless of the age, which would just be suggesting something like that. So we need to make our claims about the population based on the population that we're actually sampling. This is a problem for some research because a lot of psychological research is done on what age people. What type of adults? Older adults, younger adults, generally every all types of adults? Generally, younger adults, right? There are occasionally some older adults in college courses, but predominantly the studies are, that are using college students are more heavily weighted to using younger adults. So you want to be careful when you are making interpretations about some correlation to make those interpretations based on the population that you sample from, which may not be representative of the population in general. Does that make sense? All right. Other things, predictions that you make using linear regression will typically be worse when predicting from values of independent variables that weren't represented in the sample from which the regression equation was created. OK, that's, that's kind of a mouthful. So imagine that we have these data. This is the whole population, but your sample, you only got this, right? So if you wanted to predict what someone's score on this dependent variable would be given their independent variable, what do you do? You do a simple linear regression in this situation, right? You would come up with a slope. A slope, is that a regression coefficient or a regression constant? Coefficient. It's a coefficient. Come up with a slope, and we come up with uh, with an intercept, and this defines some line, right? Some line like that. Oh, wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> now, when I am making predictions about some dependent variable based on IDs that are within this range, I should be getting fairly close to this line, right? I mean, my predictions will all fall right on the line. And the variations in the actual scores should be fairly close to that. But as we start to go beyond what our range has, especially for this type of a relationship, we're making a prediction up here. And it's, oh, it's hugely different from what we actually observe. Why is this? Well, it's because we were basing our predictions only on this, and we're trying to extrapolate to go beyond what we have data for. So if you are using regression for prediction, you should try to ensure that your sample includes any values of the independent variable that you could potentially be interested in. All right. Talk a bit more about prediction. So let's talk a little bit more about prediction. When will we have a perfect correlation? Non-correlation. 
when the correlation is 1 or minus 1. Minus one. When will that happen? When there are no errors. When when the variables are perfectly represented by a linear relationship, right? So each point would what? If we were to plot a perfect linear relationship, what would that plot look like? It would look like a line. Every single point would fall right on that line, right? So we will have a perfect correlation when a linear relationship between two variables completely describes all of the variations that we see. When all of the points in a scatter plot fall on a single line. These are basically equivalent, right? Just different ways of looking at it. When every score is just as extreme on both variables, right? So you have a really extreme score on one matched with an equally extreme score on the other. Right? A not at all extreme score on one matched with a not at all extreme score on the other. So this will almost never happen for interesting variables. Things like test one and test two scores, those are interesting variables. What types of variables are not interesting that you would see perfect correlations? What? Homework one and homework two, you shouldn't even find a perfect correlation there. Test two, test two. Basically, a set of scores with itself, right? It's not really that interesting. I've had something else, size in inches and size in centimeters, right? But it's still size, correlate size to size. And if there was no error in our measurement, right, there, there's a formula. You can use Google, in fact, 10 inches to centimeters, and it tells you what it is. There's a perfect correlation. You go up one inch, you go up so many centimeters. That's not really interesting. Interesting variables are the ones where the correlation isn't usually wrong. Okay, so let's talk about regression towards the mean. Let's, let's go back for just one second. So I said, we'll have a perfect correlation when every score is just as extreme on both variables, right? Okay, on average, scores that are extreme on one variable tend to be less extreme on other variables. When you have a non-perfect correlation, this is what happens. Something that's ex really extreme on one is, on average, not as extreme on the other, and vice versa, too. So, regression towards the mean has to do with extremes. It has to do with prediction. It has to do actually with the real world view. It describes groups and it describes individuals on average. So let's take a, a closer look at regression to the mean and see how it does these things. So if you Google regression to the mean, you'll find a lot of bad answers. So people will say regression towards the mean is an artifact or it's a statistical artifact meaning that it's like something not real, it's something that like, you know, artificial, that doing statistics introduces. In R, we deal with artifacts on the homework. Like sometimes your answer that should be correct is marked as incorrect, why? Because of? No, well, it has to do with some variability, but variability in... One of the teachers that I knew in statistics would spend like a whole lecture on one concept. It had to do with rounding, rounding, right? And different people's installations of ours present things with more or fewer digits of precision, right? So the correct answer is like, 0.1169, and you answer 0.117, and it's marked as wrong, right? That's an artifact. <clears throat> Regression towards the mean is not an artifact. It's a mathematical necessity. Anytime you have a non-perfect correlation, you will have regression towards the mean, which is on average scores that are extreme on one are not as extreme on the other. This is a necessity. So let's restate what we said before. 
So on average, scores that are extreme on one measure will tend to be relatively closer to the mean, right? If you think about extremeness, as in how far away something is away from the mean, right? If you're right at the mean, you're not really extreme. If you're three standard deviations above the mean, that's really extreme, right? So previously, we said, on average, scores that are extreme on one will tend to be less extreme on the other. If we restate that using the mean, scores that are extreme on one measure will tend to be relatively closer to the mean on the other. Or we could restate it with means up here too. Scores that are relatively far away from the mean on one measure are relatively closer to the mean on another measure. So regression explicitly reveals this mathematical necessity. So these are the data that we started with, right? Not the curve linear relationship, the linear relationship, correlation of 0.83, highly significant, right? So we have this population. Now we're going to do a z-score transform. We're going to transform all of the independent variables scores into independent variable z scores. And we're going to do the same thing with their dependent variable. All of the dependent variable scores will be transformed into dependent variable z scores. So how do we get the z scores? We actually don't even need to think about the normal distribution at all in order to do a z score transform. You guys remember the, the formula? So z is equal to x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation, the standard deviation of x. And this is not, this is not our estimate of the standard deviation that's based on the unbiased variance. This is like the population form with n on the bottom instead of n minus 1. So if we do this, if we take all of our dependent variable scores and transform them into z-scores, what will happen? What will the mean of our transformed dependent variable scores be? No. So what we are doing is we're weighting each difference by the standard deviation, right? And when you do this, you get a distribution that has certain properties. Things are measured by the standard deviation. And what is the standard deviation of a set of z scores? One. one. The standard deviation of a set of z scores is one. What's the mean of a set of z scores? Zero. So by transforming our dependent variable, we should have now a z-score dependent variable that will have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1, right? And our independent variable, if we transform them into independent variable z-scores, what should we have? The mean should be 0. The mean should be 0. And the standard deviation should be like 1. Yes, and the standard deviation should be 1. So let's do it. So there are the raw scores. Boom. So, those are our Z transform scores. You guys notice anything? Same, same correlation. It's exactly the same. We're going to get the same correlation. We're going to get the same overall like distribution shape. All that we have done basically is shifted where the means are and shifted or basically compressed the variance. So it, it doesn't have a standard deviation of whatever it had before. Now it has a standard deviation of 1. But if we zoom in appropriately, we get exactly the same looking data set. Exactly the same looking scatter plot. So we should have exactly the same correlation. Now, the z-score gives us an index of extremity. Right? The z-score of 1 tells us that how extreme is it? It's one standard deviation away from the mean, right? The z-score of 1 means we have one standard deviation away from the mean. Negative 0.5 means it's 
one or 0.5 standard deviations beneath the mean, right? All right, so the correlation is identical. The distribution is identical. Now imagine, in the real world, if, or maybe in the theoretical world, if the correlation was one, if each pair was equally extreme on both measures, what type of function would describe the data? Linear. A linear function. What would the slope and intercept be? The slope is going to be. The slope would be zero, so it'd be like this. The slope would be one. The slope would be one, right? It would be one standard deviation away from the the mean on our independent variable should also be one standard deviation above the mean for our dependent variable, right? So if each pair had the same extremity on both variables, we would expect everything to fall on a line like this. So zy equals zx. The slope is 1. The intercept is 0. All right. So if every pair is equally extreme, they should fall on the red line. But they're not. The correlation isn't one. What was the correlation? 0.83. 0 0.83. This means they don't all fall on just that line, right? So we can create a line that best fits those data according to a least square type sense. And if we plot that, we get something that looks like this. So this is the line of the best fit. So notice, here it's just a little bit different from the previous function. We multiply by r, right? Do you guys remember the formula for beta or for finding the slope? So slope is equal to the correlation times the standard deviation for y divided by the standard deviation for x. But here we have z-squares, right? So 1 over 1. This is r, right? The correlation times the x z-square. And the intercept, we have no intercept here. Do you guys remember the formula for the intercept? Yeah. Intercept equals mean, here I'll write it here in um, using the notation that we're using. So zy minus, minus core zy zx. The correlation, it doesn't matter which one you put in first. Okay. Times mean zx. Well, mean of zy is zero, minus correlation times zero, that's zero. So the intercept is just zero, right? So this is the line that the least squared should fall on if, if there was a perfect correlation. In fact, the least squares would be zero if there was a perfect correlation. Everything would fall right on that line, right? That would minimize the least squares. But there is not, did I say if there was a correlation of zero? If there was a, if there was a perfect correlation, all of them would fall right on. I'm not sure what I said. However, we don't have a correlation of one. We have a correlation 0.83. So we calculate the line of best fit, and the least squares are minimized about that. Now we know, OK, so predicted dependent variable scores are less extreme than the IV scores. So if we look at like how the, the red and the blue lines, what am I trying to say? How they, I guess the overlap? Not overlap, the, the differences? Yeah, the differences. So notice here, the blue line, this, all of these, these are our predictions, right? If this was a perfect relationship here, all of our predictions are actually closer to the mean. 
on this side. And all of the predictions also are closer to the mean on this side. So basically, except for this point right here where they overlap, the blue line is always closer to the mean than the red line. Does that make sense for any two points? So this point here compared to this point here, this is actually closer to this than this one is, right? So in the last slide, I said that regression explicitly reveals this necessity, right? So when we do the regression and compare it to the line that we would have if there was a perfect correlation, we see that our predictions on average are closer to the mean than what the perfect correlation would indicate. Okay. Regression of the mean is tricky because people often want to make conclusions about correlations that aren't really warranted. So imagine that the data were measuring happiness before and after psychotherapy. Okay? So we have some measure of happiness. So this person, this would be what, the IV, so this is before and after. Okay, so for each score, we have a before score and an after score. And it's best described by the blue line. This is best in the least squares sense. So you have a bunch of people. You measure their happiness. You send them to therapy. You want to see if there's a relationship, maybe if therapy improves happiness, OK? Therapy improves happiness, maybe everyone should go. Now, there's not a perfect correlation between the before and after scores. What happens? Well, the depressed people, on average, got better, right? What happens to these people, the people that weren't depressed? People that were happy to begin with. They didn't change? They changed how? Yes. Well, if we look at this, right? Ooh, it got better. The people up here actually did worse. So happy people got worse. What? So you, you send a bunch of people for therapy, you get their happiness scores before and after, and typically what you will see is that the people that were the most depressed end up not being as depressed later. And the people that were happiest, they end up being less happy later. So people might want to conclude what? People might want to conclude things like therapy makes depressed people better, so if you're depressed, you should go see a therapist. And therapy makes happy people worse. Right? So if you're happy, don't see a therapist. That's what some people might want to conclude. That is not what you should conclude. This is regression to the mean. Yes. yes. <laughs> or was that a... There is a mean, uh, uh, there is an average for happiness. Uh-huh, there's an average for happiness. And uh, these people were already happy. They will, they, uh, it's hard. Uh, but they, they were high above the mean, right? Yes, they are above the mean, and it's difficult to make them more uh, happier in this uh, depressed people situation. Okay, so you might say that the people that are really happy, it's going to be hard to make them any happier, right? So you can't really make them better, but should it make them worse? 
person who has the worst mood at one time, and they also have the worst mood that is equally extreme at the other time. But on average, on average, people that are really, really happy at one point may be happy later because there are personality factors involved and other things, but you wouldn't expect them to be as happy, right? People that are really, really depressed at one point, you would expect them to not be so depressed later, even without therapy, right? Why? Because there's not a perfect correlation. The only time that you would expect them to be equally depressed, equally happy, equally strong, equally fat, equally whatever you want to talk about, the only way you're going to expect them to be equally extreme at both times is when there's a correlation of one. Otherwise, on average, you would expect them to be more extreme on one than they would be on the other. Right? So, regression to the mean, it is not an artifact. It is a necessity for anything that is not perfectly correlated. So, because the correlation between two measurements like these will never be perfect, we will always see results like these, even if therapy has no effect. So what should you conclude? What should you conclude? You know this now, and now you can say, well, forget it. I know that depressed people will get better by themselves. So psychology is a waste of time. You no longer need to come to school, pay your tuition, don't tell the president that I said this. You can just all go home and, and pretend that you're psychologists and people will get better. Is that the right conclusion to make? No. <laughs> what else is there? You should see how depressed people get better without therapy and how depressed people get better with therapy. Oh, an experimental manipulation. So, you have a control group, one that gets pseudotherapy, and an experimental group, one that gets the real therapy that's under question. And you would expect that both the, the extremely depressed people in both of those, if that doesn't have an effect, they should both go up equally, right? But if there is an effect of one therapy, if one therapy is better than another one, and the only way you can tell this for sure, well, not for sure, it's never gets proof, but the only way that you can be reasonably certain is to understand statistics. This is why statistics is really important, even if all you want to do is go and be a counselor. Someone came to my office and they said, Dr. Knapp, I don't understand why we need to learn about statistics. I just want to help people. Well, if you want to help people and you want to help them the best that you can, you should study. Maybe you don't do the experiments yourself, but you can read the articles that other people have done. And if you don't know about regression to the mean and how to do statistics, you can't be sure if the claims that they're making are really justified or not. So yeah, <clears throat> I argue that his interpretation is, is great. This is part of why understanding statistics is so important. And it's also why appropriate research methods why appropriate research designs are so important. Now this is a statistics class, not a research methods class. So I'm not going to be talking any more about them. All right, so we still have a little time. So on the last class, not the last class, on the last test, we had three students who did really, really extremely, extremely extremely well on the last test. What are your predictions about those students for the next test? Less, less extremely well. Less extremely well, which is equivalent with worse, but also suggests that they should still probably be doing well, right? But let's think about all of the things that influence test scores, right? Things like how hard they studied. <laughs> things like whether they got a good night's sleep. Things like how intelligent they are. Or you could talk about the different types of intelligence and the logical mathematical intelligence, right? 
So all of these different things come into play, and maybe a little bit of luck too. They don't know what the right answer is. They have to pick. Some students, when they pick, they're going to get it right. Some students, when they pick, they get it wrong. So if we had three students that just happened not only to have studied well and be, you know, uh, smart in the logical, mathematical reasoning sense and all of these other things, but they also got lucky. That luck is going to do what to their scores? Push it up. So what should happen in the future? They shouldn't be equally lucky in the future. Maybe those other things will stay the same. But if they're not equally lucky, lucky, then on average, what should happen? On average, they should be less extreme. Right? In fact, I would guess that luck may not be the biggest factor. If they did so extremely well on the last test, what might happen to their incentive to study for the next one? Increase. Increase? Okay, you said something about it. It could decrease, but uh, it also, in some cases, it might increase. So. It depends. So some people, when they do extremely better than everyone else, this motivates them to study more. I would actually predict that they would study less on average. They'd say, good grief, I could have had fun doing all these other things that I could do in college, and instead I studied so hard, and I did really, really well. So maybe I don't need to study as hard for the next one. This will also tend to push them closer to the average for the next one. Whatever that will be. And I would predict the worst people should do better. It's funny, like, it's, it's really sort of easy to forget about regressions to me. Like, this happens regularly. I get exams for test one, and I, I look at the exams, and I look at the students, and I'm like, oh, they got this? Yes. I was hoping that they would, and I'm like, ooh, they got that? Oh, man. And then, like, the next test, I'm like, well, this person, they did worse. They did better on the first one. Well, regression to me alone would expect that they should do worse on the second one. Right? Because generally, people that are extreme on one measure won't be as extreme on some other. But when you say extreme, you mean, okay, if someone got 90 something, let's say 95, mm -hmm. wouldn't he get, it might get 95 in the last test, but still less extreme because considering with everyone else, well, so the, the, the less extreme does have to do with everyone else. 